Oh, there was one question from your textbook, page 149, number 10. I believe that dealt with polynomial inequalities. Uh, the, the main gist of yesterday, what it boils down to, is that you build the equation of a polynomial function based on the graph by looking at the factors created due to the x-intercepts. What does that mean? It means if we have an x-intercept of negative 4, you have to have a factor of x plus 4. And because this graph doesn't have any weird shapes around the x-intercepts, all of the multiplicities are 1. Uh, we also have an x-intercept of negative 1, which means that we have the corresponding factor of x plus 1. This is really an application of the factor theorem. The 0 of the polynomial produces the factor with the same 0. And then we have x minus 3 as a factor because there's an x-intercept of 3. What is different, what's changed, is you can't always rely on the fact that your work is done here. What you need to do is consider the fact that you could have some constant multiple out in front. And we can use a or c or k or p or any letter you want. I guess you don't want to use x or y. Um, if you take a look at this one, and I chose this for a specific reason, if you multiply out all of the constant terms of those factors, you get negative 12. Just let that percolate in your head for a second. If the value of p out in front were 1, in other words, if we didn't need to consider some constant multiple in front, we would say the y-intercept is negative 12. And when you take a look at the picture, the y-intercept here is positive 12. Well, this is a particular question that you could very easily do that to determine the answer. Just by inspection, you go, well, I need a negative 1. But it's not always going to be that way. Uh, first of all, sometimes, like question 2 in your handout, you're not given a y-intercept, you're given some other point. So when you build this polynomial function, it will contain some number out in front. I'll use p again. It will have an x plus 2. It will have an x plus 1. It will have an x, and it will have an x minus 2. Again, so far this morning, the only ones I'm looking at have clean x-intercepts. They have multiplicities of 1 for all of the factors. There's no tangent points. There's no inflection points. Um, knowing that <laughs> the y-intercept is 0 is absolutely no help at all because if you multiply all of the constant terms, you're going to get 0 because the constant term in this factor of x is 0. We're just going to get 0 for a y-intercept. But if we multiply that function that you're looking at by different numbers, it stretches it vertically or it reflects it vertically, but it won't move that y-intercept. So the y-intercept is a non-starter. It doesn't help us. What you have to do is use the ordered pair that's given. The ordered pair is that when x is 1, y is negative 8. So you would load in the y-coordinate, the x-coordinate, and solve this little equation we create. We get negative 8 equals p times, we have 3 times 2 is 6 times 1 is still 6 times negative 1 is negative 6. And that means that p is equal to 4 over 3, 4 thirds. As I said, that's the gist of the lesson. Does anybody have any questions? Arden. Eight? So you're told the y-intercept, you're told the x-intercepts, and you're asked to determine the equation of the graph in factored form. And then you're asked to write the equation using only integral linear factors. Now, I did change this question in the past, so I want to make sure that a, b, and c are worded, or a and b are worded the same way up here as they are on your handout. OK? 
Okay. So determine the equation in factored form. And you may wonder what the difference between A and B is, and I'm going to explain it. What I'm going to end up doing in A is answering B, and then I'll go back and I'll answer A the way some people might. See, well, let, let's talk about this first. What is an integral linear factor? Well, a linear factor is a factor that's linear, which means it contains x's and numbers. Okay. This is an example of an integral linear factor. This is an example of an integral linear factor. It's an integral linear factor because the numbers are integers. Okay. This is not an integral linear factor. That is not an integral linear factor because it has decimals in it. Okay? So, I would say to you that we always want to work with integral linear factors. And maybe what I'll do, I've changed my mind on how I'm going to get around my explanation here. I'm going to answer A the way some people might, but it wouldn't be an answer that would be acceptable on a multiple choice. Some people might say, for A, can I erase this stuff on the right? Okay. So some people might say, for A, that the polynomial function p of x has some constant number in front, which could be 1, but we can't assume it's 1. And then they would say, well, if there is an x-intercept of negative 1, we have x plus 1 as a factor. If there is an x-intercept of 1, we have x minus 1 as a factor. And again, all of these x-intercepts are clean. You know what I mean by that? They have a multiplicity of 1. Um, and we have an x-intercept of 2.5, so one of the factors is x minus 2.5. And one of the factors would have to be x minus 3. And then what you would do is you would use the fact that 0, 60 is an ordered pair to find the value of your constant multiple in this polynomial function. And we would get 60 equals a times 0 plus 1 times 0 minus 1 times 0 minus 2.5 times 0 minus 3. And what would we get here? Let's see. We would get 60 equals a times, well, this is 1. This is negative 1. This is negative 2.5. This is negative 3. So we have to multiply those numbers together. And I believe we're going to get negative 7.5, but I just feel a little off on that. I think it's negative 7.5. So then A would be equal to 60 over negative 7.5, which by my count is negative 8, I think. Yeah. So a person who does this by using decimals, which is generally shied upon or, or frowned upon, rather, is going to get the following for their polynomial function. They're going to have p of x or y equals negative 8, and then times the x plus 1, times the x minus 1, times the x minus 5 over 2, times the x minus 3. And I believe, is that right? They're all minus except for that one? They are. So I, I've, I've taken the liberty to kind of segue into the next question, B, written that as x minus 5 halves. 5 halves is what 2.5 is in fractional form. 
And you would, uh, I don't believe you would ever, ever see this on a diploma exam or this on a diploma exam. And, you know, I'm pretty sure even on a written response, if you put this, I mean, technically it's right, but it, it's not a standard practice. So now the question is, for B, what is the equation using integral polynomial factors? And what you need to do here is, I'm going to say we're going to do it in the proper way. And I'm going to use the letter B because it's going to be a different number than A. I'm going to say this is how it should have been done to begin with. You should have said that we have a factor of x plus 1. We have a factor of x minus 1. We have some factor that's going to produce that x-intercept of 2.5. We'll come back to that. And then we have a factor of x minus 3. Okay. So let's talk about that factor that gives us 5 over 2 for an x-intercept. Well, if the x-intercept is 5 over 2, and by the way, how many of you know this is 2x minus 5? I mean, if you, if you see that, then this explanation isn't necessary for you. But if we go, let's go to a different x-intercept. We had an x-intercept equal to 3, correct? If I zero that statement, I get x minus 3 equals 0. So this is the x-intercept. This is the factor. So basically, we're almost always taking the factor and rearranging it to get an x-intercept, but we could do the opposite. I could say, since I don't want fractions, I'm going to multiply both sides of this by 2 and get 2x equals 5, and then I can subtract 5 from both sides to get my factor. So this is where we're at if you do it the proper, I'm going to say the proper way. Now we're still going to load in, was the y-intercept 60? Is that what this question said? Okay. I'm still going to put in 60 here, and I'm still going to put in 0. But the product of these numbers is not going to be negative 7.5 anymore. It's going to be uh, 1 times negative 1 times negative 5 times negative 3. It's going to be negative 15. And what we end up with is 60 equals b times negative 15. So we end up with b equals negative 4. So when you do it with decimals or fractions instead of integers, you get this. When you do it with integers from the beginning, you get the following. And I can easily demonstrate to you that they're the same thing because that negative 8 at the top of the screen is negative 4 times 2. And if I think of that negative 8 as negative 4 times 2, and I decide to multiply the 2 in here to get rid of it, it's going to leave me with a negative 4, and it's going to turn that x minus 5 over 2 into 2x minus 5. And every time I put this note package together every semester, I contemplate whether I should just get rid of that a and B and just say find the equation of the function. But sooner or later somebody does write x minus 2.5 as an answer, so it needs to be addressed. And I think that was the basis of your question is what's the difference between what they're asking in A and B. Any other questions? Pardon. Certainly. Certainly. 
I think this is a tricky question. It, at first, it looks pretty simple. Okay. Um, but I seem to recall that I once answered this question by kind of using a process of elimination and getting the wrong answer. First of all, what you could do, and I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, because if this is the only way to do it, then you won't be able to do anything for a written response. But what we could do, and this would be a lengthy process, is put 12x cubed minus 2x squared plus 10x minus 4 into our calculator for y. We're asked for a polynomial function that has those zeros. And what that means is that when you put those numbers, negative 1, 1 half, and 2 thirds, when you put them individually one at a time into that function, it, it tallies up to 0. So double checking to see that I've entered that correctly, and I believe I have, if I have my table set up to be in ask mode, then I can just go into my table and I can start loading in negative 1. I can see right away that A is incorrect. And, um, you know, if you did this on a written response and you want to show why negative 1 is not a 0, you would actually write... 12 times negative 1 quantity cubed minus 2 times negative 1 quantity squared, etc. But that's prone to mistakes, right? We can make mistakes when we write all that stuff down. Um, so let me try now. Well, I'm not going to do it. You could then try all of them, right? And sooner or later, you would get one that would give you those three numbers as being zeros. However, and I don't know really that there's a clean, easy algebraic way to do this, this polynomial function, and I know it doesn't say p of x, but I'm going to make it p of x, must contain an x plus 1, must contain a 2x minus 1, must contain a 3x minus 2, and I'd like you to contemplate those final two factors that I wrote. This is really just what we were talking about, about the 5 over 2 thing. Um, and uh, let me explain to you what I did when I first saw this question. I said that if I multiply this out, I'll get 6x cubed. And if I multiply out the constant terms, I get plus 2. And I made a fatal error here in saying that I believe then the answer is b. And I don't believe the answer is b. I, I'm pretty sure it isn't. That's a correct statement. So. Could the answer be, based on what I've got here, could the answer be A without looking at my calculator? And the answer is yes. Because if I had a number of 2 in front of here, that 6x cubed would become 12x cubed. And, well, actually it can't be A, can it? Because the only way to get 12x cubed out of that, and those factors must be true, the only way to get 12x cubed out of that is to multiply by 2, and then you would end up with 2 times 2, which is 4. Uh, so it, it actually can't be this, and it can't be this either. See, this is why I think this is a very difficult question. Short of doing this on your calculator or doing what I'm doing, which is kind of a logical reasoning, Unless you're willing to try to factor all of these, it's, it's a very difficult problem. So th the basic idea here, and let me summarize this because I'm pretty sure most of you didn't get my point here, is if you ignore the number that could be in front, you will end up with positive 6x cubed for a leading term, and you will end up with positive 2 for a constant term. So whatever you multiply that polynomial by as a number, the first term and the last term have to both be positive or both be negative. So that's why I'm eliminating um, A and C. Could it be, based on this, could it be B? Yes. Now, we know the answer isn't B, but you're writing an exam and you don't know that. Could it be D? Yes. Because if I multiply everything by 5, that 6x cubed is going to turn to 30x cubed. The 2 is going to turn to 10. 
And as I'm standing here, I'm trying to figure out if there's a, like a surefire way of doing this question other than checking the zeros against all of the choices. And I don't think there is. So you have to go through and do what we did on our calculator with all the choices. I'm going to assume it's D because B doesn't work. And the reason why I say I think that's the only way you can do it is if I said, well, no, the algebraic way is to factor all of these, D is the correct answer, right? There's no guarantee that A, B, or C are even factorable. But, I mean, they might not be factorable at all. Not all polynomials are factorable. Uh, this is a, a very difficult question, unless you approach it from the standpoint of putting in the zeros. Does that answer your question, Arden? Okay. Other questions? Go ahead, Ian. Number 10. This is somebody's brilliant idea to come up with a contrived application of polynomial functions. I mean, it's so contrived. Contrived means just made up, ridiculously made up. We're going to design a cross-country ski course, and we're going to use a polynomial function to describe the shape of it. Well, no, you'd, you'd use your artistic and engineering abilities and design the, the course. Anyway, the route, the polynomial, is tangent to the axis at x equals 1, the x-axis. So if we start sketching this polynomial, at 1, there's a point of tangency. What that means is that the polynomial function I'm going to immediately put a number in front that's unknown. Right? And that's what you need to get used to on an exam or an assignment. What that means is the polynomial function has that constant multiple in front, which might very well be equal to 1, everybody, but it probably isn't. And then it's going to contain an x minus 1 squared. I'll explain why it's squared and not to the 4 in a second. But basically I've told you, and I think I told you this yesterday, you had asked about it, you go with the minimum degree. All right. Um, and it crosses the x-axis at negative 5 comma 0. There's an implication there, Ian, that when it says it crosses, unless it says it's, it crosses in an inflected manner, it's crossing in a clean fashion. And it also passes through, wow, just a second here. It's also tangent, I missed that other point, it's also tangent at negative 3 comma 0. So we have another factor that has a multiplicity of 2. Are you good with that now? Okay. The reason why I know those two tangent multiplicities must be each 2 is because it, you're told it's a degree 5 polynomial. And if, if either of those tangents were another even degree, like 4 or 6, then you would be going past the degree 5. Um, what is the function that meets these requirements? Well, what you're missing here, everybody, is A. And let's face it, what, what makes this question, everybody looking up here, different then say this question or this question is that the information is not given to you as a picture of a graph. It's given to you in words. And the numbers are hidden in the words. So now, in, in fact, you know, I'm not even sure that this diagram is helping us out. Right? I mean, you should know that if the x-intercept is 1, the factor is x minus 1. Are you with me on that? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to get rid of the diagram. We don't need it. Uh, what we are told is that the function passes through negative 2, comma 9. So that means when I put negative 2 in for x, the 
the result has to be 9. So I get 9 equals A. Let's see. Well, this is 9 because negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3, and I have to square that to give me positive 9. This is positive 3. Negative 2 plus 5 is 3. And this whole thing will be 1 because negative 2 plus 3 is 1. 1 squared is 1. 1 times 3 times 9 is 27. So we end up with 9 equals a times 27. We divide both sides by 27 and get a third. And that's the polynomial function. I, I mean, I should rewrite it and put a third in for a, but I can leave that part of it in your capable hands. Does that make sense? OK. Any other questions? All right, so this is the handout I've just given you. Um, I don't personally, when I give a unit exam in this unit, I don't personally think this is a big deal, but you might see a question where you're asked to identify functions that are polynomial in nature. And basically everybody by now, after working with polynomial functions for the past six classes or whatever it's been, uh, you should recognize that something like y equals 3x plus 1 and y equals negative 4x cubed plus 2x plus 5 are polynomial functions, but everything else in the list, uh, those are not polynomial functions. Because polynomial functions have to have um, whole numbers as exponents on the variable x, if the variable is x. So in the first example, we have h of x, and there's a root x there. Well, root x is x to the half. That's out. Uh, f of x equals 3 to the x is out because it doesn't even fit the pattern of having x in a base raised to a natural number or whole number. Um, P of x in that list is not a polynomial function because you cannot have a negative exponent. So you never know. Make sure you understand what a polynomial function is in terms of the coefficients, the exponents, and the basic structure of the function. This page here goes through all of the important things that we learned basically on the first day. The constant term in a polynomial function, and I want to be very clear here, this is if the polynomial function is in expanded form. What does that mean? It means it's multiplied all out. It's not in factored form. It's written, if it's a degree 4 polynomial function, it's written as ax to the 4 plus bx cubed plus cx squared plus dx plus e. The constant term is the y-intercept of the graph. These are all things you're going to be tested on. If you want to know what's on the exam, this is on the exam. Um, the constant term, which is the y-intercept, could also be found by multiplying the constant terms of all of the factors if you have it in factored form. The leading term is the product, and I'll, maybe I'll pause there and let you know. When I say leading term, I mean the term with the highest degree. The leading term is the product of all of the highest degree terms in each factor. And that's important because the coefficient of the leading term tells you what the right arm of the graph is doing. If the coefficient of the leading term is positive, the right arm is up. If the coefficient of the leading term is negative, the right arm is down. The leading term is also important because the degree of the leading term tells you the degree of the polynomial function. And if that degree is an even number, like 2, 4, 6, etc., then both arms have to go in the same direction. And when you put that together with the leading coefficient, you can decide basically whether both arms are up, both arms are down, right arm up, right, left arm down, or the other way around. You can piece that together. Make sure you know how to do synthetic division. Um, synthetic division is used to take a polynomial and divide by a binomial that's a linear binomial of the form x minus a. You've got lots of practice with this. I would caution you, though, synthetic division is not the answer to all questions. It's not the way to go. 
you know, the classic example is, well, I'll show you one. The classic example of a question that if you use synthetic division, you're going to be, um, running into trouble. There's a good one right there, number 11. Close this and make it a little bigger for you. When the polynomial 2x cubed minus 5x squared plus ax minus 5 is divided by the binomial x minus 3, you get a remainder of 16. Synthetic division connects all of that information, but synthetic division is not the way that you would answer that question. You would use the remainder theorem, which we'll get to in a second. So be very cautious about the usefulness of synthetic division. That question that you're looking at right now, by the way, is on a different handout that you'll get shortly. Make sure you know how to do synthetic division. And I'll just remind you that, like in this example, if you are missing a term, we have x cubed plus 7x squared and then minus 4. You don't have any x terms. You don't have any linear terms. You need to put a 0 in that placeholder. Um, you are expected to know. Go ahead, Marcel. The question is, are you going to have to know how to do long division and the answer is no. Okay. Um, make sure you know the relationship between the polynomial that you're dividing by, the divisor that you're dividing into it, the remainder and the quotient. And it can be written in two ways. You can either take on the bottom of the screen the quotient times the divisor and add the reminder, remainder, or you can take the polynomial divided by the divisor, and that's going to equal the quotient plus the remainder over the divisor. It may seem like a very unimportant detail, but I, I may ask you, for example, this is a really good question, that I tell you in the question, when you divide a polynomial and you don't know the polynomial, I just say, when you divide a polynomial by x minus 2, you get a quotient of this and a remainder of that. And I can ask you, what is the constant term in the polynomial? And you should understand that the polynomial can be found by multiplying these two things and then adding that. So if that's the case, Negative 2 times 18 would give you negative 36 as a constant term in that product, and negative 36 plus the remainder of 32 would give you negative 4, which is the constant term in the polynomial. There are ways that I can test your understanding of this, what we call the di division algorithm or division statement. The factor theorem is very important. Sorry, the remainder theorem is very important. When you divide a polynomial by a binomial, then the value of the polynomial at the zero of the binomial is the remainder of the division. In other words, you divide by x minus 2. If you put 2 in for x, you will get the remainder for the polynomial. Um, that is how you would do something like question 11. You would say that if dividing by x minus 3 gives you a remainder of 16, that means that p of 3 has to give you 16. So you would write 2 times 3 cubed minus 5 times 3 squared plus a times 3 minus 5 equals 16. I'm not going to finish this question. It's, it's turned into a grade 9 or 10 question. Now you solve for A. The factor theorem takes that one step further because if, looking at the top here, if P of A equals 0, but the remainder theorem says p of a is the remainder, then when p of a equals 0, 0 is the remainder, which means a is a 0 of the polynomial, which means x minus a is a factor of the polynomial. And this statement above with the bullet beside it 
is used to explain these three factors. Can you look on your handout? Do you have another factor? Okay, that's coming up. So it's used to explain those three factors. You can combine the factor theorem with synthetic division to factor polynomials. But again, you can kind of cheat by looking at x-intercepts to determine the zeros to determine the factors. There we go. Rational zeros. Something like one-half. If one-half is a zero of the polynomial, what that means is when you put in one-half in for x, the polynomial equals zero. But one-half is not an integer. It's, it's, a ra it's a rational number. And I, again, I know integers are also rational numbers, but we, we call this a rational zero. Make sure that you can connect those rational zeros to the linear integral factors. We had an extensive conversation at the beginning of today's class about this based on Arden's question with the 2.5x intercept. Make sure that you understand the relationship between those. Multiplicity, so we're, we're almost done here with review. Multiplicity refers to how many times a specific factor appears in the polynomial function, or it refers to the number of times a specific zero appears in the function, or it refers to a specific number of times that a particular x-intercept appears on the graph. Now, I'd be, I want to be careful with that, because if it's an x-intercept of 2 with a multiplicity of 4, there's not four x-intercepts there, right? There's one x-intercept of two. It just has a particular shape. Make sure you understand that multiplicities of two, four, six correspond to... Make sure you understand that even multiplicities greater than zero, zero is even, so I don't want to include it in there, um, correspond to tan tangential is the actual word, uh, x-intercepts that are tangent to the x-axis, and odd multiplicities of three or more correspond to inflection points. So as an illustration here, just in case you can't picture that in your head, this polynomial function that you're looking at has three different x-intercepts. The one on the left has a multiplicity of one. The, that's at negative four. At negative one, there's a multiplicity of three. Most likely three. Don't try to be clever and make it five or seven. Go with the minimum unless you're told otherwise. Uh, because that's an inflection point. And then the third x-intercept, the x-intercept that five, has an even multiplicity, probably two, because the shape of the graph is tangent to the x-axis there. And really, finally, finally, building an equation of a function from a graph or drawing a graph from an equation of a function. The connection here is bigger than just the x-intercepts and the multiplicity and the factors. Uh, you know, I can guarantee you, and I'm sorry to say this, but I can guarantee you, you will have questions like this on the exam and many of you will get it wrong. Because you will just look at it uh, I'm not a big fan of that graph, the appearance of it, by the way. But you'll look at the information, and you'll say, well, it's inflected at w negative 1, so we have an x plus 1 cubed. It's tangent at 3, so we have an x minus 3 squared. And you better believe that if you look at the choices in a multiple choice question, this would be a choice. But it's wrong. Turns out it's wrong. Now, might it be right? Maybe. But you have to go through this process of determining what that constant multiple is before you commit to an answer. So when you build your equation, you build it here by putting in some constant multiple. And then you put in the ordered pair. In this case, it's 2 comma negative 26. And, and the thing about this is I don't think many of you would get this one wrong necessarily because you can see this information here. But if it's in words, that information might be loaded in a camouflaged manner. You might not really notice it. It might not be prominent. Anyway, that's the review session. Quick 5, 10 minute, well, 10 minute thing. I'm going to hand out the multiple choice numerical response 
practice handout. Remember, I'll remind you what I told you before about written response. I'll talk specifically about the exam tomorrow, but written response questions are essentially, they can be any of these questions that you're going to be looking at that are multiple choice numerical response. I just change it into a written response, break it into two parts, one, one part for three marks, one part for two marks, and uh, it becomes a written response. So I'm going to hand this out, and that's what we're working on today. Try to get as much of this done for tomorrow as possible so that we can learn from our questions that we're going to go over tomorrow.